Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to the uh, VUCTSI Community Engagement um, Third Thursday Speaker Series. Um, I'd invite all of you to please introduce yourselves by putting your name and your affiliation in the chat. And I encourage you all to um, turn on your cameras while we engage in discussion with each other. Um, my name is Dima Hakim. I'm the program manager of the Community Engagement Program. And I would like to introduce our facilitator for tonight, Tracy Battaglia, who is co-director of the BUCTSI CE program, as well as the director of the BMC Women's Health Unit. She's been working with communities for over 20 years, practicing community engagement before it was cool, with organizations <laughs> like the Boston Housing Authority and Asian Women for Health. We're very excited to have her um, join us in facilitating the session. So Tracy, please take it away. Thank you, Dima. Thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces and also to see some new faces. Um, as Dima mentioned, um, we'd encourage you, we don't have time to, to sort of meet one another, but we'd encourage you to just put your name and your affiliation in the chat so people know who they're um, spending the hour with. Um, tonight, um, I'm really, really excited to be here. For those of you who do know me, I'm a primary care health services researcher here at the medical center um, and really passionate about engaging stakeholders in the research process with the explicit goal of improving the health of our communities. And I've had the distinct honor and pleasure of partnering with um, pro providers and practices affiliated with the community health centers over the years and really have come to respect and value these partnerships. And so tonight's goal, and Dima, if you don't mind going ahead and advancing the slide, um, is um, for us to come together and to have a dialogue. I hope that this, this evening is more of a conversation than presentations. Um, I'm very excited to introduce you to my colleagues who have joined us to um, be the panelists for tonight's discussion. I'm here simply to facilitate the conversation. Our hope for our conversation tonight is to come away with some understanding of facilitators and barriers to developing authentic research relationships with community health centers, talk about best practices and lessons learned from the All of Us Research Initiative, and learn about, about new processes for partnering with the Boston Health, Set, health Net Community Health Centers. There's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes to facilitate um, research academic partnerships with the community health centers. And we're here to get started in disseminating that information. So we hope that you'll keep your cameras on and engage in a dialogue with us. If you have questions throughout the, um, the evening, please place your questions in the chat. If you'd like to ask a question, we'd encourage you to just raise your hand. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So um, I'm just gonna, um, frame with a couple of slides sort of um, the, the relevance of sort of having this conversation. Um, I think this audience is quite well aware that um, Boston, Massachusetts is sort of the home of the, the nation's first community health center. And, and this uh, photo from the Mass League um, demonstrates um, that history. And so if anybody knows who this doctor is in this photo, I, oh, and Charlie's raising his hand, put it in the chat, Charlie. Stephen knows um, that represents the uh, founding sort of father of sort of community health centers. Very proud yeah. of that here in Boston. Geiger, yeah. that's it. Thank you, Charlie. Um, but of course, we all know that community-based services be, are provided in these practices, regardless of insurance status or ability to pay. And in Massachusetts, we're fortunate to have 52 community health center organizations providing high quality care to some 1 million state residents through more than 300 site, sites statewide. So excellent care is being provided to the community through the community health centers. And so um, next slide. Research and community health centers, why are we having this conversation? I think there is probably no better pragmatic site for health equity research to happen than within community health centers. But people on this call tonight are likely very well aware that there are numerous challenges to participating in research for all of us, but specifically for those 
participate, providing care at the community health centers. And I would posit that at the root of these challenges is the lack of authentic partnership between researchers and academic institutions. And tonight's dialogue is really meant to start to help develop those authentic relationships. And my computer is telling me that I've been online too long and I have to put my ID back in, so I'm sorry. <laughs> too many Zooms today. Next slide. Um, so we are fortunate enough to um, be affiliated with Boston Health Net, which um, we're going to hear about from one of our panelists, Dr. Williams, in a bit. But this is just to recognize that um, we have a direct affiliation as Boston Medical Center Health System with 11 community health centers that sort of really um, signify um, where a lot of the primary care is happening within our own institution. And so for all of those reasons, this dialogue is important. Next slide. So I'm going to start with a little story. Um, and then sort of hand it off, um, introduce our panelists and, and begin sort of the dialogue and the discussion. And um, Dr. O'Connor may remember this conversation. Um, some of you know, I'm from New Jersey. So every summer I go back to the Jersey shore for summer vacation. And um, in, during that week, I try to turn off as best I can. But when my colleague, Dr. O'Connor called me while I was on vacation at the Jersey shore a couple of summers ago, he said, Tracy, we have this wonderful opportunity for this new research pro proposal that's part of the Precision Medicine Initiative across the country. We need to participate in this as a medical center and get access to this opportunity for our, our community. Um, so the request was, can you help me identify community health center partners to partner with so that we can take advantage of this wonderful opportunity? And, and as it often happens with these types of research projects, there was a very tight timeline. And so at that time, we didn't have an infrastructure to systematically reach out to our community health center partners to make this opportunity available quickly to all. And so what do we do in those situations? We turn to our friends, right? We talk to the people that we know, which is good and helpful, but it's not inclusive. And so it was at that time that I, we were able to connect with another good friend of ours, Dr. Stephen Tringali, um, who represents um, Dotwell, Dorchester House, and, and Codman um, Community Health Center to sort of create a relationship to take advantage of the All of Us initiative. The spirit of tonight's discussion is to learn from the All of Us initiative um, leadership about the successes of that partnership, because there are many but then to also talk about how to put processes into place so all researchers can take advantage of these relationships to identify new research opportunities for um, the community and, the, and our patients. Next slide. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then hand it off to them. So from the All of Us Research Program, um, we have with us tonight, um, Mr. Uh, Daniel Mompoint, who um, is the research navigator for the BU CTSI program, the Clinical Translational Science program. He was also a senior research assistant for the All of Us Initiative. Uh, we have Dr. George O'Connor, who's the director for the BU CTSI clinical research program and the principal investigator for the All of Us Initiative here at BMC. And then we have Dr. St Stephen Tringali, who's a family medicine physician at Dotwell. He serves as medical director amongst many other leadership roles um, at Codman Health Center and is a co-investigator on the All of Us Initiative. They're going to talk with us a little bit about the All of Us Initiative and their experiences partnering. Then we're going to open it up for discussion for question and answer. I'll kick us off with the first question, but then open it up to others. And then um, at the half hour, we're going to transition to um, our next panelist, Dr. Charlie Williams, who's a family medicine physician who actually practices at East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, but also serves as the medical, medical director for Boston Health Nut. And he's gonna walk us through some new processes that are being put into place to support community academic partnerships. Um, and so with that, I'm going to um, ask Dima to advance the slide and I'm gonna turn it over to the All of Us team.
thanks so much, Tracy. Um, I'm going to just um, fly through a, a, a brief slide deck here just to give those of you who may not be familiar with the All of Us Research Program a brief overview of it. Um, then we're going to just I'm going to turn things over to, to Danielle and to Stephen uh, to talk about um, how we tried to make this partnership with uh, Codman Square Health Center and Dorchester House, Dot House and, you know, uh, and some of the challenges we've faced and some of the approaches we've, we've taken out there. Um, but just to briefly introduce you to the All of Us Research Program, um, which the New England Consortium for the All of Us Research Program is Boston Medical Center, together with Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass General and affiliated health centers. Um, next slide, Dima. And um, so this uh, program began uh, at, in the 2015 State of the Union Address. Barack Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, which was a brainchild of Francis Collins and others at NIH. Uh, and uh, as he said, he was hope, the hope was that this would revolutionize medicine. Um, next line. Next slide, please. And uh, a cornerstone of this precision medicine initiative became known as the All of Us Research Program. And this is a nationwide program to enroll a million volunteers who are willing to share their health information um, so that researchers across the country can analyze, can, can you know, study not just one disease, but the whole spectrum of diseases. Um, trying to look at how individual characteristics predict health outcomes, predict responses to medications, influence which diagnostic approaches should be used, um, which is why it's called the All of Us Research Program. It's not a study of one disease. It is a research program which will enable researchers uh, to analyze the data on these million volunteers. Um, the, um, not only do the, the, the volunteers initially agree to share information by filling out questionnaires and sharing their electronic health survey, but then over time, they will be asked to provide additional data on an ongoing basis, typically by answering follow-up surveys as the years go on. Um, there are other ways in which they can contribute data. For example, if they have a Fitbit that they wear around to monitor their exercise, you can automatically share that information with the All of Us Research Program. So now we have re exercise data on people, et cetera. Um, the, the fourth bullet on this slide, the data are shared freely and rapidly to inform a variety of research studies. Um, those of us who were involved in enrolling the All of Us cohort have no special access to these data. These data are available to any researchers across the country who have a data use agreement um, with the um, All of Us Research Program. So I'll point out to those of you who are faculty at BU and Boston Medical Center, both institutions have data use agreements with the All of Us Research Program, which enables any of us who are faculty at BU or, or at BMC to analyze All of Us um, research data. Uh, next slide, please, Dima. Now, one of the core principles um, of the All of Us Research Program, which I mentioned in the previous slide, was that the million volunteers need to be richly diverse and to really represent the full diversity of, of, our, of our country. Uh, and a big part of the study is genomics. It's not just a study of genetics, but, but genetics and genomics are, are an important part of it. And this slide just points out, you know, some of the background behind this notion that it needs to be a very diverse cohort. If you're studying the individual characteristics that predict, predict health outcomes, you need the full range of individual characteristics, whether it's behavior, whether it's diet, whether it's genetics, you need to make sure that the entire spectrum of individual characteristics are represented or you won't be able to study it. And this is a study from 2016, which points out that in genome-wide association studies, trying to study risk factors for disease, um, the, uh, the majority of participants have been of European ancestry with uh, a woefully small um, a minority of, of participants belonging to other groups. And even in 2016, where you see that little, uh, you know, somewhat of an increase in that blue piece of the pie, but the light blue is Asian population and the darker blue is other non-European. So now we've got 81% European ancestry, a growing percent of Asian, and still a tiny little sliver representing all the other groups. So um, in genomic research, non-European, non-Asian um, you know, participants have been underrepresented. So it's, it's a major uh, value and foundational principle of the All of Us Research Program that we're trying to remedy that and have a really diverse population. Next slide, Dima. So there are HPOs or health provider organizations all across the country that are sites for enrollment. This is from a New England Journal piece in 2019, which is a summary of the program. Uh, the New England 
plus sign there is for our, our New England consortium. Um, the, uh, some of these health provider organizations are big health uh, centers or um, uh, health systems like University of California system. Others are if, if federally qualified health centers, which are freestanding um, FQHCs that are funded to be enrollment sites for the All of Us Research Program. Next slide, please. Um, um, what do get, uh, participants get for joining the program? Well, one of the things is that is returned to participants is when they, uh, the genetic information is analyzed, um, there are some things one gets back that are sort of fun, like you know, gen genetic ancestry, what proportion of your ancestry comes from what part of the world, kind of like ancestry.com, that sort of thing, as well as you know, genotype for sort of interesting, fun traits, but not medically actionable. Do you have the gene that makes you love cilantro or hate cilantro? So you know, fun little things like that go back to the participants. Uh, perhaps more importantly, if in the genetic analyses, which are being done for research purposes, not for clinical purposes, if the genotyping and ultimately genetic sequences discovers a clinically actionable genetic variant that's associated with disease, any participant who has requested to have that information returned to them will be provided with that information with genetic counseling that goes with it. If you turned out to have a genetic variant associated with a severe cardiomyopathy or arrhythmia risk, you would be told that if you've indicated you want to receive those results with genetic counseling. Next. Um, slide. So how are we doing so far? Nationwide, about 400,000 people have uh, volunteered to join the study. This shows a, a, rate, um, a breakdown by race, race and ethnicity. About 46% are white non-Hispanic, uh, and the rest belong to other groups, as you see here, about 22% uh, black or African American, about 18% Hispanic or Latino, and some of the other groups that then you see there with a median age in the 50s, um, male to female, about 60% about female. So it just gives you a sense for how we're doing so far with about 400,000 enrolled. Now of those, um, six, about, about 6,600 have been enrolled by our BMC site. That includes, I think Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, about 400 approximately at Codman and about 200 at Dot House. Is that about right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so that's how we're doing with that. Next slide, Dima. So this is my final slide. You know, the what makes this perhaps a particularly nice um, initiative for enrolling at the neighborhood health centers is that everyone is eligible to join. Right now, that's everyone who's age 18 or over and speaks English or Spanish. We hope to get to other languages later as funding permits. But right now, you know, there are no health related criteria for joining the study. If you speak English or Spanish and are 18 or over and, you know, and are competent to consent, anyone can join the study. Uh, it takes about two and a half hours to join. You can either do the whole thing on person or you can do most of it online if you have computer resources at home, do the consent and surveys online, and then just have a 30 minute visit for the biospecimen collection and to measure your vital signs. So that's a, you know, an overview of the, of the program. Now from the beginning for our BMC site, it was a combined BMC, Codman, and Dot House um, site was planned. And, we were um, lucky that Steve agreed to join us as a co-investigator in this initiative from the very beginning. So I'll turn things over to Steve and Danielle to tell you a little bit about uh, you know what's happened at Codman and Dot House and the challenges and our approaches. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, this is Steve Tringali. Um, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. And this is Daniel Monpoint. Yes. Um, Okay, so uh, yes, my, my name is Daniel on point. I'm uh, a research navigator with the uh, uh, CTSI and uh, I work with uh, all of us, all of, as I used to say with uh, some friends, all of us was like, is my baby. So we started with all of us uh, from uh, scratch. And then I had the opportunity to go to Codman and also serve uh, as a uh, senior research assistant uh, at Codman, and also I help at uh, that house. I don't know if Dr. Uh, Tringali would like to elaborate, and then I can just uh, talk about what's ha what happens on the ground when we are uh, over there in the health center. Okay, so I guess I'll back up just a little bit and uh, just uh, speak for a few minutes about 
um, sort of what the processes or challenges are because they're, they're one and the same and it's how we've how we've managed that. Um, so so one of the things Tracy started saying, you know, there's a quick turnaround uh, for research, it seems uh, very often. And the mobilization from the health center side um, is complicated uh, for us. Um, so uh, so for example, um, there's a, a process that we need to to go through in the organization to decide, well, does this fit for us? Is this something we wanna do? Is this valuable to our patients? What will our patients think about participating in research um, or hearing about research? Um, we're, we're in the business of taking care of patients uh, in primary care. Um, research though also um, is recognized and has been recognized more recently uh, to be important to our uh, patients who are underrepresented in research. And I think that's really important. I think that was sort of specifically for this project, that was sort of like, that was the, that was the hot item. That was the item that was like truly outstanding from any other project that we've ever participated in. So um, that, that actually was, uh, you know, what made this particular project very special for us. Nonetheless, um, there's some practical things that we that we also decide upon. Um, there may be some oversight and thought about, well, you know, does this does this make sense even you know as a from a research perspective? Does this does this really make sense? Is there something important here? Um, as George said, this is a program. It's a little bit different than research, but yet we approach it in the same way. Um, second, do we in the organization have buy-in? That takes a little bit of while, a little time. It's, it's, it's about mobilizing at that point and engaging. Uh, and this one was particularly important for us to engage leadership in at a very high level, all the way through out the organization to include uh, engagement with our staff. And that was actually a very special part of this particular research project that doesn't usually occur. Um, uh, another element that's important for us in all research and for this is, well, do we have the resources? So what are the resources? For the health center, it's um, patients and the right patients and the languages and the skill set. Um, it's space, um, it's time, and it's matching all that. Um, uh, it might be leadership. It may be someone to serve as a point person or a champion. Uh, for us at Codman Dorchester House, we always... Uh, when we engage in, in any research projects, need to identify a champion uh, in the house. It seems like things cannot happen without that. So uh, that was true for this particular uh, research uh, as well. Um, and then uh, uh, again, special for the All of Us project was um, this program um, really was special to our patients, to our leaders, to our staff. Uh, it, it the, our staff are our patients, our patients are our staff as well, right? And any health center that that goes hand in hand. Um, but this was particular um, a particularly exciting sort of angle uh, for me, um, and I think the all of us team is to to be part of, to engage with. Dan was here with a few other people along the way, part of our our employees, that team then engaging all our staff. So it was, it, was, it was great to get in front of our staff at some important meetings there and talk about what does this mean? Um, it was wonderful to see the engagement with, with some of our leaders and some of our staff who after the meeting, you know, wanted to sign up. So um, this was a pretty exciting kind of program to participate in. Um, and I wanna hand it over to Daniel next because there's some uh, specifics that Dan had to deal with um, and want to make, uh, again, uh, an important point that the people that we had here from the All of Us program um, often spoke the uh, common uh, language of culture and community um, here with our patients. And that was one way to address our patients. Go ahead, Dan. All right. So, uh, yes, I remember uh, the first time we uh, arrived at Codman, uh, the first uh, the most important thing we saw that was very important is for logistics. We're going to put our uh, supplies, lab supplies, uh, all we need so we can conduct uh, the research. So logistics was <clears throat> the first uh, important, uh, I would think, uh, in, our, in our mind so we can understand if we're going to have the visits, which room it gets to have available. So logistics is very important. 
we're going to have the, our visits and follow-up visits because we have retention. So that's uh, those are key logistics and also access to IT just in case that the system is down. So we say that logistic is a very important aspect. The second aspect is, I would say, partnership with the employees because we were like external. We're BU and what we're there, the other employees from Putnam would like, who are they? <laughs> so it was like very important for us to build and thanks to Dr. Tringale and his uh, staff over there. So we could uh, develop quickly uh, that relationship with the employees. Uh, <clears throat> so we can have like a to go, a go to person. If we want to, for example, we have an emergency and uh, adverse event. So we know that, oh, we can go to the judge nurse. Uh, we know that uh, if we need Dr. Tringali, we have a phone number to call because, so that's very important. And front desk is very important also because uh, we are in a certain, at a certain location. So the first people they see, the patients, sometimes, sometimes they don't know how to get to where we were. So it's very important to uh, front desk know, they know where we are so they can uh, direct our patient, our participants to where we were. So that was very important to have that kind of partnership, that relationship, I would say, with the, the employees. And then comes the third element, is the relationship with the patients, with the uh, participants. And we need to understand that any patients, when they get to a hospital, they have uh, other priorities. They prior prioritize their healthcare. Or in our case, when, what I saw at Codman, mostly we have like uh, people, they're immigrants, first generation or second generation. So they have like, they prioritize basic uh, uh, needs like uh, they need to know about their insurance. If it's not their healthcare, it's about where I can get myself when I get. So it was very important for us to tap into that, try to connect them with the right resources. And next time, because they have their, their patients there. So once they come back, they will say, oh, okay, what's, what's this about? Sometimes they used to call all of our research program. They say, oh, what's the survey? Uh, <laughs> are you doing surveys? So it's, it's, but anyway, that created the fact that we help them connect with any basic service that they needed. Could be like insurance myself, could be uh, the portal, uh, how to access their own uh, health record. So it was all, all, always important to have that partnership. So we have like those three elements that's very important. And we, I realized also is representation is key because they feel represented in the, all of our staff that was there. They could say, oh, and they, I, I was glad that they took pride in, in the fact that, oh, okay, you're from South Africa. We have Darien and you're going to study medicine. And Darien, when back, I remember some uh, uh, patients or participants, was, they was like, oh, I feel glad that there's someone from my country or someone from, my, from where I'm from can be in that position. So representation was very important. That helped us a lot to, up, to approach the patients and tell them about the All of Us research program. So, <clears throat> and the other things, I always try not to impact negatively the workflow of the all, uh, Codman employees, because we are doing research at Codman, but we don't want to disturb them. Uh, so that's very important to always uh, be, be mindful of that even though they are helping, but we don't try not to, we try not to interrupt their workflow. And that was very, very successful when we could uh, manage all those elements. Logistics, partnership with the employees, we sometimes we, that was one of our best practices. We would uh, go to the huddles in the morning. So we would have like two minutes. We can tell, give them quick up, updates about all of us, how many people were, we are enrolling and or we just tell them what it's about. We just give them like quick uh, overview of what all of us is and like elevator pitch and quickly. So it was very important to have those to be there and also to have some holders with flyers in specific strategic position so we can make ourselves more visible to everyone. And, and also we have like a banner with Spanish in Spanish and English. Uh, and that was uh, always, sometimes uh, we, have, we would have some patients that would come up to us and say, 
uh, okay, I say that uh, there's anyone who speaks Spanish here? And we say yes. And who has, and they were like really uh, happy and relieved sometimes to, to hear, oh, there's someone who can uh, explain everything in their language, or Haitian Creole or Spanish. Or uh, we remember we had uh, people from, you know, of, from Africa who speak French or any other language or Portuguese. So it's always good to have people uh, who represent them. And that because that creates trust and they, it creates uh, a room for dialogue. And I think, you know, approaching patients is educating them. Because I remember when we say genetics, in, in, in the case of all of us, they usually say, oh, what is that? You would, because when we see that most of our participants, I would say, based on the metrics that we have, we have like, uh, most of them, they, they don't finish uh, college. So they don't, so is, there's a, it's very important to know how to talk, to address them on using terms that are easy for them to understand. So I remember for some Haitian patients, I have to, when I say genetics, I say, oh, you remember, this just the same way if you're bringing someone from Haiti, you need, you know, the embassy, US embassy needs to check if it's your family. So if it's your kid, or not, so you can bring that person to the US. So it's pretty much like genetics. It gives you information about your family, about people who, and on a more, uh, on a broader level, it would give you information about people who look like you. And that can help medicine understand. So it's uh, understand how to help people with this kind of problem from these characteristics, could be genetics or could be other forms of, or other characteristics that are very important. So it's very important to use words, how to explain, break it down to uh, patients. And I think all of us was like uh, a very good, uh, I, I would say experience in combining all those three uh, elements. And if it, there's any questions, so we would also, we're open to answering any questions. So then I'll, I'll point out that, you know, Daniel mentions many of the challenges and issues he faces on the ground. Of course, the big challenge for an investigator like me or Stephen is to find someone like Daniel Montpoint, who um, not only has fluency in Spanish, Haitian, Creole, and English, but has the ability to meet a new person and within minutes be speaking to them as if they're his aunt or uncle. And, you know, his is a natural warmth in that connection with people. And, you know, and you just can't hire anyone who applies to you for as a research assistant job and put them in that position and expect them to succeed. You know, you really have, have to look for the, the diamonds like, like Daniel Montpoint to, who can really sort of make that connection with people. Thank you all for that wonderful uh, story and highlights of sort of your challenges and successes. Um, I'm going to encourage people to put questions in the chat. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just make a few reflections and ask one question of all of you before we transition to Dr. Williams. Um, the passion that I hear in your voice, Daniel, is just so amazing and, I, and inspiring. And so um, what I, I put in the chat, a couple of things that I was taking away from this conversation, which are about the facil facilitators to sort of successful authentic partnership between the research teams and um, the health centers. And so I wonder um, if you could comment, and um, I always appreciate this question, is sort of if you had a magic wand and you were able to pick one thing that really facilitated an authentic relationship, because I can tell from the three of you talking you have developed an authentic relationship across the research team and the community health center team. Can you tell the audience one thing that you think is the magic sauce to that authentic relationship? One thing. I would say uh, one of the, the one thing I would be this relationship building. I mean, it's, Addressing the patient's basic needs first, not the, yep. not the, not the study. Great. Yeah. Stephen or George, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, I think, I think from a, a different level of perspective of like what's, the, what's that link um, with a researcher uh, for the health center, it comes down to trust. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a charged word. There's lots in there. 
uh, but it's absolute, um, the most important is trust because, um, um, you know, great, uh, George did a great job, I think, speaking to me and, and engaging me into something that like touched me, um, you know, specifically for this particular project in a special way. Um, but what I know from working with, with, with people and with researchers is that not every element can be known in advance and worked out and understood in advance. And so the most important thing to me is like, what's the framework? What am I working with? Can I trust someone when something mm -hmm. comes up that we can work it out together or identify it? So trust. Thank you, Stephen. George, you want to add anything? I, I would simply, I think it builds on what Stephen just said. I mean, I, I've been around the block enough to know that I could not figure this out sitting in my office at Boston Medical Center. So I knew I had to, you know, turn to Steve as a co-investigator, have Daniel go out there along with a couple of other, other staff, and that it, the integration with the health center and how to approach patients would need to be worked out on the ground locally. I, I didn't even attempt to think that I could figure this out and make suggestions to Steve, you know, how should we do this? I said, you know, I'm gonna send my talented people out there to work with Steve and they're just gonna have to figure it out on the ground, how they integrate. Um, so I think that that's a key thing. Every health center is totally different. I mean, we were, Steve is involved with both Codman and Dot House in a leadership capacity, but they're very different. Mm -hmm. Even Codman and Dot House are very different and the approaches we've taken have been different. Um, so I, I think you just have to realize that every health center, just, you know, every setting like that is its own place and the folks on the ground need to figure these things out. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for your insights. I'm gonna encourage folks to keep asking questions in the chat and George and Daniel and Steven, feel free to respond in the chat, but I'm gonna move us along and I'm gonna introduce Dr. Williams to take us on a journey um, on sort of the um, process and um, um, procedures that are sort of being put into place to facilitate relationships like this for other researchers moving forward. So Charlie, you wanna take it away? Very good, thank you, Dr. Battaglia, and thanks everybody else. So I, th I think the specific example of the all of us uh, gives a good uh, introduction to sort of uh, what we've been working on in the health net along with the health centers and the CTSI uh, over the last almost six months now, actually, but mm -hmm. it's uh, four or five months for sure. Um, can you see my slides? No, not yet. Oh, sorry. I pushed the wrong button. There we go. There we go. Um, all right. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk through uh, a little bit of the reboot of the research process that we've had um, over the last six months. Uh, we had really robust conversations with the health centers and uh, CTSI and HealthNet. All of us have been involved with research. You know, I've been at BMC almost 25 years now. And, you know, there's been research going on in the health centers before I got there, obviously, and there's been different forms and forums to kind of do this. Uh, and yet uh, there was a recognition that we needed to kind of make it even better um, because it wasn't uh, meeting uh, the needs of our patients in this way that, that Stephen mentioned that, you know, we recognize that our patients are underrepresented in research for conditions that have particularly um, hit them um, this year. Uh, COVID being the most sort of acute example of that, but many, many other, other things and disparities um, in the care of the patients that we uh, help. So the health net agenda and current focus is uh, many things, but it, it, the intersection that we started with here is applying the health equity anti-racist lens and, and research and to try and move that forward. Um, and that's the space where we were looking at. We engaged in a process starting back in actually May, um, and we've had four retreats with the health centers and researchers uh, to try and help us kind of see where the barriers were in the process, make sure that we were all aligned and really understand going back to first principles, what the interests of the community and the community health centers was in this space. And so we backed way up with a series of interviews in May and then planned for a first retreat in June 
And th that first retreat to, was sort of trying to look at, um, you know, what are the top challenges facing health centers who are interested in engaging in research uh, uh, when, when investigators reach out to them or when they want to be the investigator themselves. It can come from either direction or even when somebody from the community approaches them to say, I'm interested in helping this problem in my community and doing a project around it, can you help me? You know, um, how does that even look? And so we looked at a number of aspects of that aligning the research with the health center's priorities um, and, and other things. So, and again, the past year highlighted the, me, the many um, inequities that are going on in the healthcare system, but also within the research. And as the COVID clinical trials, you know, tried to happen in a rapid kind of way, it pushed our infrastructure and processes um, kind of beyond where it was ready. And that's where we sort of noticed this gap and we were trying to look in, to re-strengthen this to see what we could do. And at the same time, recognize that um, the, the patients that we're committed to and, and that we're committed to um, have in their communities a legitimate mistrust of the research um, for all kinds of reasons in the backgrounds historically. And so when you look at, for example, the, the COVID data, who had it? and then who was represented in research, there's a big uh, mismatch of who's participating in the trials and who was actually hit by COVID. And the question is then how accurate is the, the research? You know, are there genetic differences that we're not seeing uh, or, or is it actually legit? We don't know. And so we wanna sort of match the populations truly to the people that need to have the information to know how to treat them best. Um, there is a lot of research that's been happening in the health centers and is currently happening in health centers. It's just kind of a summary of the ongoing trials um, over the years at the various health centers in the Boston Health Net. Um, and so when we interviewed the health centers, the top challenges that were identified were, you know, sort of saying like, how is the alignment? Is there a win, 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 you know, and how do we propose the research benefits to our patients, our staff, our boards, our communities, and our, our uh, colleagues. And then as Stephen pointed out, do we have the bandwidth and the infrastructure in the health centers to actually be able to do this? Uh, you heard from Daniel and Stephen, the very specific kinds of things that make all the difference in success in research. Uh, and if you haven't planned for those, it's not necessarily going to go very well. Um, another challenge was that investigators from the point of view of the health centers often approach too late in the process to accurately budget and plan for those resource, resource needs, um, which may differ in fact from academic clinics. They may be the same, but they may be different. And as George said, each health center is unique and different and that is definitely true. Um, and then there's a concern about data use. Um, health centers, as you may know, have independent boards that are made up of more than 50% patients. And those boards oversee everything that happens in the health center. And a lot of times the boards have concerns about how's my data gonna be used, especially uh, given that the boards are made up of the patients that work there and we're taking care of populations that have been traditionally uh, and rightfully wary of research because of historic things that have happened that are horrible. Um, so there's legitimate sort of caution going on there. Uh, and then also there's a lack of information sharing back and forth uh, with outcomes of research in the long run. So these were some of the concerns identified from the health centers. There are a couple other concerns identified by our health net team on behalf of the health centers and also some identified uh, main challenge for the researchers is how do you quickly gauge the interest? Because as, as Tracy pointed out at the very beginning, even the all of us trial was like a really tight window to respond to. And that's the big thing. So after the first, um, retreat, we, we identified, we took those five issues and bucketed them into kind of four major areas and came up with a series of uh, tools based on a, a lot of the work that Stephen's done at, at uh, Common Square and some input from East Boston and then other health centers as well um, around a set of guiding principles, some rules of engagement, and then the concept of a health center research bio. And I'll show you an example of what that would be in and uh, how we are thinking about using that. And then we mapped out sort of what does the research process look like? So from the beginning when an RFP is announced 
um, all the way through to writing the initial application, waiting for scoring and whatnot. And then you receive word that you look like you're gonna be funded and then what happens next and then, uh, and so forth. And what happens usually now is that an RFP might happen uh, that the researcher puts together a proposal and says, well, like, it'd be great to have some health centers. Maybe they reach out, maybe they don't. Maybe the health centers say, no, no, we don't have time, uh, but, but we'll think about it. So list us, you know, and, and there's not really a lot of collaborative planning. And then a certain percentage of those grants actually happen. And then so suddenly, oh, I've got this grant, I need partners. And then you go back to the health centers and say, hey guys, we're ready. And they say, well, I never said I was ready. I said, I might be ready. And, and then so, not only have you not maybe planned as well as you could have for what the needs of the health center would be like the health center's caught off guard and other things. And so we approach late in the process. And what we heard from the health centers loud and clear is that we really need to start much earlier in the process. Um, even though it's a very tight time window, we need to do that to really feel like it's collaborative and to truly adequately plan so that you're gonna be successful be because of all the examples you just heard in the other uh, panelists about how important it is that little details do matter. And the engagement of the health center really matters to successfully conducting whatever kind of project you're trying to do. Um, and then there's this other part, which is the report out as the project's happening that has often been neglected as well. And we heard loud and clear from the health centers that after it actually starts happening, we'd actually like to hear how it's going and how is it going at our site and how is it going across the sites if it's a bigger project and then what's the end result and can people, for example, like the champion of Cod Square be involved with writing the paper and maybe get their name on a paper or something. Sometimes people are interested in that. Um, so how does that look downstream as well? So we put all that together over the series of, of four retreats. And I think we have a, a, a good updated process to pilot. And again, how is this actually gonna work? I don't know, we'll try it and we'll see. Um, but I think there was pretty uh, excellent input from health centers and I think the, the pretty good, um, in fact, one person that wasn't so involved all the way along was very pleased with the end result in the fourth meeting when that person came back. So. So I think it's, it's looking pretty good. Uh, Stephen can give his opinion as well. And so let me go through the updated process um, and then really the, tell you about the pilot phase and, and that's really about it. So here's, so same slide Tracy showed you, there's the health net. Um, so how would we like you to uh, partner with us in the health centers on a research project? So first of all, we're gonna have all this posted. Um, Allison Richmond could be here today because she's just coming back from a trip, uh, she got to go away somewhere fun. And Allison has really been instrumental in helping us um, get all this materials together. And so she'll be the contact for the Boston Health Net Research Subcommittee uh, for all of you if you have questions as well. Um, so you reach out, you read the guiding principles and the rules of engagement, and I'll, I'll go through those with you quickly here. Um, you utilize the health center bios to identify potential partners that already have aligning priorities. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and then you contact, and this is a new identified named position. It may not be a new person, and maybe somebody like Steve Dragali, who's been in this space for years, but a, a research liaison who's a representative at the health center who um, knows the health center, but also knows the research process and you contact them with this interest form that we've sort of developed. And you reach out as soon as you hear about the project and think you might want to involve a health center. And uh, that way they get there as soon as possible, ideally a month before grant submission to help with the planning. And then <clears throat> the health center is gonna to say like, are we, a, does that sound interesting or not? We agree that it aligns with our interests or not. Um, and then you would engage with the health centers who express interest in a sort of little bit more detailed show and tell about what it might involve. And then if they're in, then you actually enter into more of a collaborative planning and write the grant application together to make sure that you truly represent the health center's um, needs in this area. And maybe it's several health centers all working together with you if you have multiple sites um, so that we really support um, 
all the aspects of the project. And there's a bunch of other people there we've had on the group, Tracy and Rebecca, Bill Adams, myself, um, and others that will be involved with this process ongoing. Um, and the CTSI has been invaluable in helping us craft this process as well with the health centers. So let's look at the guiding principles and rules of engagement here. So number one is research uh, needs to be aligned with the health center priorities. Um, and rules of engagement <clears throat> are set out in two columns. The researcher has to be well aware of the priorities that are identified in the bios and ad address the local relevance to, of research. Um, the health center needs to review and update the bios annually to keep the information up to date to make sure that it's efficient and effective communication. Principle number two is communication is transparent and regular throughout the whole process. And again, the researchers inviting the health center to discuss ideas at least a month before um, to make sure that budget guidelines and awards amounts are discussed from upfront to develop data plan use and security plans to make sure that the concerns about security are met. And then also define cadences and methods for reporting out the study even after it begins, as I mentioned, in sort of the, the, the active edge and the, the write up edge of a project. And the health center really needs to be timely in getting back to researchers and then be a collaborative partner. Um, and another aspect of that might be um, prep to research questions like, is there enough information in this space that we could actually look at your data about mammograms or whatever? And sort of that is another aspect that we talked about. Um, the third guiding principle is that health centers are adequately supported and treated as equal partners. <clears throat> And the fourth one is the potential benefits to all participants um, are prioritized and the workflow impact is considered. And that speaks more um, to patients as well as um, staff at the health centers. Um, and, and that one is sort of thinking that wherever possible, and this comes from the, the research committee at Dotwell under Steve's uh, leadership, that really even the, the control arm of a, of a trial say, should have some kind of benefit or improvement uh, for the patients who don't get the treatment or the intervention or the whatever it is, so that we try and leave the health center of the patients better than we found them. It's sort of like the wilderness code, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. Leave no footprints, uh, take nothing but pictures and whatnot. Um, and Charlie, so really just look giving you the five minute warning. Yep, yeah, sorry. No problem. Um, and so you can read those. Anyway, um, here's what a health center bio looks like. Um, the liaison is at the top, the CMO and the CEO are on it, um, general statistics about the health center demographics are there, and then the important part is this sort of research priority topics are identified here, so you look through this as healthcare for the homeless, they're interested in doing health impacts on homeless, substance use disorders, etc, 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 and then we, we have one of these for each health center, here's Codman Square, um, some of them are more or less uh, detailed in these prioritizations. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is setting up um, a forum where the liaisons from all the health centers will get together with members of the CTSI and the Boston Health Net to kind of norm what is that role all about, learn from each other and share and collaborate and develop a peer group along with some of the researchers to figure out how to do the process better over the period of this pilot. Um, and then here then is sort of a, a, a flow lane diagram of how you might engage in the dance of research with a health center where you um, come up with a proposal, you approach the health center, uh, and then you complete this interest form. The health center gets it and confirms alignment and responds within two days. The CHC, if they're interested, then they schedule a meeting, you do a show and tell. And then if ever, all the green lights are up, you collaborate on writing um, a, a grant and then submitting. And so that ideally you're at the table for the whole process with all the partners and there are no, or at least less surprises down, down the road. There's never no surprises in research, but um, anyway. And so we have some materials to support that, a job description uh, sort of for the liaison role uh, and so forth. And so Pilot phase, when's it gonna start? Starting next month is the idea. So right now we are, we're working on it. Um, so the basic aim of this project in the middle of the page here is to develop and promulgate uh, innovative practices and new knowledge uh, that improve the health and equity of the communities we care for. 
we're coming up with a set of metrics to sort of generate like, is this new process working better than the old process? Um, and we look forward to people starting to use this new process uh, in November and December as a, as a way to, to sort of uh, engage the health centers more upfront and more successfully uh, overall. So that's it. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Charlie. So we have two minutes and I wanna be very respectful of everyone's time. I wanna first thank our panelists for their sharing their wisdom and their time. The amount of time and effort that has gone into the Re All of Us Research Project and um, this um, Boston Health Net research um, model is um, amazing. And um, it takes a, a, a village, right? There's a lot of people that need to be recognized and acknowledged for the work to get us here. And so um, I certainly took away some pearls of wisdom from each of our participants. Um, we fully expect um, that there are questions that we're not gonna be able to answer. So we encourage you to put anything in the chat. Um, I saw a question there from Mary Tara about patient advisory board. Um, we don't have that yet, Mary Tara, but that's certainly something we aspire to eventually create this um, health center researcher partnership to the point that it's bi-directional. Research is coming from the health center as well as going to the health center. Um, and so that's going to be a process over time. Hopefully we'll have another forum like this next year to give you a report on sort of where we are um, and where we need to be going. Um, we will be sending out information for you about, um, about this process so that you know, you know how to access it. We'll be disseminating it and posting it online and sending out messages once it's live and ready to go. But you all had the first preview. So thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, Dima, I think, should have a final slide to encourage you to join us at our next speaker series next month. We're really excited to have several of the deans from across the university join us to talk about community engagement and um, the role of their, of um, the schools in supporting researchers to be community engaged scientists. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We'll stay on for a few minutes for those of us who are able to stay and have questions or reflections on this evening's agenda. So thank you so much with appreciation. Thank you.